All right. So, if you remember, last week I asked you, for those of you who are here, and those who are in choir, the, the choir folks will be watching this. Uh, I think it goes up on Friday afternoons, and so they'll, they'll have that opportunity to catch up. So both groups, our group and they, theirs, filled out three-by-five cards last week of current event topics that they wanted to hear something about, that they wanted me to discuss. Uh, as you know, most of the time, almost exclusively, I preach through Bible books, preach through scriptures. I don't do a lot of topical studies. And so this allows me to take your topics, things that you're asking about, and show you how to do uh, topical things. Let me, I, I want to I, I root this in uh, dis, the discipline of theology. I hadn't seen him in a while, sorry, that we have this thing, and, and we have this thing, and I have to do it with him, and so um, anyway, he's a, he's a lot of fun, and, uh, but you better be a real tough person if you're going to play with him, isn't that right? Yeah, that's right, he is, he's a strong little kid, and uh, we, we went over to, uh, to see Megan after she had had a little procedure done, and uh, he spent the whole 45 minutes jumping off the couch onto my back. And uh, I, I'm telling the truth. I'm not, yeah, I mean, he just, and, uh, and he, he's heavy. He's a little chunk when he hits you. So uh, anyway, I, I, I like Blaine. He's good to have around. So I ask you to fill out those three by five cards about topical things. I want to root this in the, in the academic field of theology just for a second. There's really two kinds of theology that, um, that we, in, in a normal Masters of Divinity program study, one is biblical theology, and biblical theology is the progression of themes through Scripture. You get lots and lots of biblical theology from me because that's the way I approach Scripture. We go, I go through it, and, and, so, and, I, and I, I root it back. It, it has to do with progressive revelation, how God didn't reveal everything to Abraham all at once and he just wrote it all down, uh, but how over the, over the years... Um, God revealed more and more of himself ultimately until Jesus came and, uh, and revealed a perfect revelation of himself in Christ. And so that's biblical theology. Uh, systematic theology, which most of you have probably heard the term, but, but uh, I don't practice it a lot. I read it. I read systematic theologies. I'm a student of that, but I don't do it a lot because it's topical. It, it takes everything in the Bible about one topic. So whatever, life, death, salvation, and it goes all the way through the Bible, not necessarily in order, and it just, it, it puts all of them into like the same category and you relate them together. That's what we're going to be practicing over the next few weeks on Wednesday nights. We're going to be searching the scriptures for what the Bible says about these topics, and we're going to put them together and hopefully come out of it with an answer that's God's answer for whatever it is that we're asking. And that's ultimately what we want to know. We want to know what God thinks. We want to know what God, God really doesn't think. God knows. He doesn't think. Think is a process. Knowledge is not. God has infinite knowledge. He doesn't have to process it. But God, uh, so we want to know what God's opinion is because his is the only one that really matters. Right? I mean, so if you came here to get anything other than this is what I believe God wants from us, then you're going to be sorely upset with the, <laughs> the progress of this. And, and that just, I want you to know that I am stepping out on a limb as well, because you are asking me questions and I'm answering your questions. Now I am, I am organizing it the way I want to, and I'm headed in the direction and ordering it the way I want to, but, um, but I'm going to address your questions. Uh, not all of them, some, several of them didn't fit any of these categories, and so I may do something else uh, another time. But I, I went through all of them, and I've tried to process all of them. But what you're asking me is not what Jim thinks about something, or not what you think about something, but how we find what God believes or God knows about it, right? So now I'm not saying I'm infallibly going to announce what God believes about it, but I'm going to show you how I would go about discerning that, how we together can look in God's word and find out what the truth is. 
and and so that's that's what we're going to be doing these are the for those in the back that can't see i'll tell you tonight we're going to do the bible uh talk about the bible i'll tell you why in just a second but um next week we're going to do salvation evangelism and apologetics uh we'll wrap all those together and we'll talk about that if you don't know those words don't worry about it i'll introduce them to you uh but there were questions that people asked about losing salvation or gaining salvation there were questions that were asked about how to witness to certain kinds of people and there were other questions about apologetics i'm I'm putting all those together and we'll get at least get a cursory look at it Uh, the next week the 20th is uh, government and politics there were questions that pertaining to that lots of questions pertaining to that and so we'll discuss those Uh, the next is sexual ethics um, we will talk uh, about that, see what the Bible says about that. And, um, and, we'll, and, and by the way, these, these would be, when I, when I use the word sexual ethics, I would mean the normal, um, the normal biblical view of man and woman in a married relationship kind of thing. This, uh, there's more to this, and I'll just go ahead and tell you what the rest of it is. I didn't want to write it all up here now, but this is homosexuality and other perversions. Now, before you think I'm casting, using pejoratives, I'm not. I'm, what I really mean is perversions from God's plan for the world. All right, that, that's really what that word means. I'm, I'm not trying to be ugly. This whole thing is not going to be ugly. It's going to be what God's word says about it and how we should interact then going forward from there. So that's that week uh, on the 17th of April. The 24th of April will be um, women's roles in church. Um, I did not pick this, by the way. I want you all to know this is, this is uh, part of, part of uh, you did. You did. You put me up to this. So that one's there. Um, death and after. Uh, so heaven, hell, um, what's death like, what's, you know, those kinds of things. So death and after. And then uh, the end of days, which will be the last week that we meet before our June break. Uh, before Memorial Day and June break. So the end of days, um, that'll be what, what the, we, obviously we can't do it all, but what, what the end looks like and are we there, that kind of thing, those kinds of questions. So that's where we are, that's where we're going. I'm going to turn this over, but it'll be here. I'm, I'm going to use this each, um, each week, but that's where we're headed, and I hope that you're excited for it. I am. I, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, there are three reasons for tonight's adventure, which is the Bible. Three reasons. Um, two of these reasons will be uniform throughout the rest of these events. Two of these reasons for everything. The third reason is just for tonight. So the first reason is to discuss your current events. I ask you what you wanted me to talk about. You gave them to me. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do that over the next little bit uh, here on Wednesday nights. Number two I want to demonstrate, and if you don't have one, to give you one, to teach you one, uh, my approach to matching today's issues with scriptural wisdom, all right? I I want to teach you, if you don't know how to do this, uh, I want to teach you how at least I do uh, anything. If you've ever come up and asked me a question um, about anything, Greg Bars, if you ever ask me a question about anything, then this is the way, you'll watch me process exactly this way. Uh, And so uh, the way that that is, is I take your question, I mean, I take take either your question or your assertion or your topic, and then I ask questions either aloud or in my own brain to find out what we're really talking about. When we ask, when we talk about whatever thing you ask me about, what are we really getting at? So I'll ask all kinds of questions. After I ask those questions, I will relate them, I'll I'll connect them to either either Bible accounts or biblical uh, uh, commands or or straightforward uh, instruction, and uh, and then I'll begin to build out a thought. If, if If you've ever asked me a question that's tough, you know I don't give you an answer that's like five seconds and we shake hands and we go. Uh, we, I, I talk to you for a long time as we walk through it, and that's because that's the way my brain works. It's processing and it's connecting dots throughout Scripture of everything that pertains to whatever it was that, that you asked me about. 
And so that's why it takes me a long time, because what I don't want to do, there, there's, no, there's no Bible book that you can turn to that has all that stuff that I just showed you in an appendix right there, word for word. It, it, because the Bible was written in time, because it was written to a certain culture in a certain language with a certain worldview, we have to make the jump from that culture, that language, that worldview to our worldview, our English language, our culture, and, and apply it. They were not asking in Jesus' day, should they go out and rob liquor stores, right? There weren't any liquor stores in Jesus' day, right? They, it, they didn't know, should you accompany your wife to the ATM so she doesn't get robbed? They didn't have any ATMs. So these kinds of things, we have to be able to bridge the gap. Nobody was asking Jesus about smoking marijuana, it just didn't happen, all right? They, they may have been talking about drinking wine. They may have been talking about even strong drink, but they weren't talking about marijuana or opioids or anything like that. So we have to do that work. Uh, it, it's really the work of ethics and the, and the discipline of ethics to take Bible scriptures and ferret out those things. You know, the, the whole question about in vitro fertilization, it, it, that's, a, that's a job for ethicists to decide if we believe uh, that that life begins at uh, um, uh, well conception. <laughs> Every word that I shouldn't have said came to my mind except that one. <laughs> if we believe that life begins there, then <laughs> sorry about that. I'm just telling you. If we believe that life begins there, what about in vitro in the glass? where they combine the, the semen and the egg together. And they do it multiple times to make sure that it, that it works. What happens to the other embryos that have already been created? Those are ethical problems. They weren't written about in Scripture, but we should deal with them. We have to deal with them because it's real life. It's what, we're, it's what we're dealing with. We have to have the answers to these and, and one of the difficult things is, is getting those answers. How do, we, how do we drill down? Somebody asked the question, I, this is not for this week, but somebody said, how can Christians uh, be divided on issues and be divided in politically and be divided that way? It's because this is not an exact science. It's not two plus two equals four. It's, it's trying to take God's word, apply it to our culture, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and, and get it right. And if you've ever been a parent, you know there are times when you parented well, and there are times you didn't parent well. Uh, you know, there are times when you spanked out of anger or whatever, and Myra, and no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, so, and so we have the, uh, we, we're just constantly trying to understand how to live this life in the 21st century according to God's Word. And that's where we're going. Which leads me to the last thing I want to say before I actually get into tonight. And that is that it's, it's possible that in this room we're going to, you're not going to agree with me. Now, here's what we have to, well, I'll you, after tonight, I'm going to say, here's what we're going to have to believe. This is God's word. It is over us. I'm not over it. It, it informs me. I don't inform it, right? And so this is the standard of our lives. If you follow Jesus, this is the standard. So you can't, you can't discount what this says. But lots of what we're going to be dealing with is interpretations of what this says, how to apply what this says. And it's possible that I'm going to come down in a different spot than you will. And that's okay. It, it, this shouldn't be threatening. This shouldn't be a, um, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't make you wonder if you're at the right church, right? So the, the, thing, the, way, that we, the way that we wrestle through this is we say, Lord, please show us, illumine our minds, and let us understand what your word is saying so that we can, because at the end of the day, we shouldn't want to do what we want to do. That's sin. Sin is to want to do what we want to do. Living under the lordship of the Lord means we want to know what he wants from us and do that. So our wants become his desires for our lives. That's, that's the end result of this. And, and so that's, that's where we're going. Is everybody good with that? 
If you want to leave, like now's the time because we're getting, I'm just kidding. Please don't. You'll, you'll break my heart. You'll break my heart. Okay, so, so for this one, for tonight, the third reason for tonight, the first one is to discuss current issues. The second is to demonstrate my approach. For this one, it's to build the foundation for all others, namely why we should use Scripture for wisdom. Because you can't, you, you got to start somewhere, and I'm going to be saying the Bible says a whole lot over the next few months. And, and so you have to understand why, at least why I believe, that what the Bible says matters more than what I think. And so that's where we're going tonight. There were three prompts. So I'm going to start with the prompts. When I say prompt, I mean somebody in this room wrote on a three by five card one of these things and gave it to me, and I wrote it down as a prompt. There are three of them that fit tonight. The first one, somebody asked how to defend or argue the Bible's authority. In fact, let me, just, let me just go here. By the way, that's a good thing to remember. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. All right? So that's Jesus talking about what? The law, the Old Testament, first five books of the, of the Old Testament. So Jesus said, you, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me, for he wrote about me. That is, that is the hermeneutical paradigm for everything I believe about the Bible. I believe it's all ultimately about Jesus, and because, because Jesus said it was, so I am in pretty good company. So here's the format, the prompts, questioning the issue, then searching the scriptures, and then expressing the implications. That's what we're going to do tonight and every night, starting over every night. So the prompts, the first one is, how do we defend the Bible? Uh, or how do, we, how do we argue the Bible? So that's, that's one that we're going to be discussing tonight. The second one, somebody wrote, define divinely inspired. Define divinely inspired. And I'm, that's all it said, so I'm presuming they're asking about Scripture. That's why I put it here. And then third, which Bible translations should be avoided and why? All right, so those are, those are three prompts. Uh, for those of you who want to know the method of my madness, I wrote all the prompts down on a piece of paper, and then I, and I started changing the font colors to everything that matched together, and then I pulled those out and lumped them together and came up with the next eight weeks or whatever that we're going to be doing. That's, that's the method that I used. So tonight, these are the prompts. But So how do we defend the Bible, define divinely inspired, which Bible translations should be avoided, and why? Here is my question for you. This is not going to be constantly lecture. I'm, I, want to, I want some interaction here. So what questions come to mind with these three prompts what questions come to mind that we need to answer today what 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 comes to mind okay how to validate all right that's good somebody else yeah so so what what i do is if if you came up and and said um, if you came up and said uh, sexual relations ought to be between a man and a woman in the, in the sacred bond of matrimony only, I would ask questions. That lots of questions would come to my mind. Um, are, is this person thinking about getting married? Is this person already married? Is, does this person... Does this person, are they asking it because they're in a relationship as a single person, they're wondering what they're allowed to do? I mean, I know people laugh about that, but that's, I mean, you know, I was a 15-year-old kid once too. And so we ask those questions. So those are the, so that those questions start me thinking, all right, what about premarital relationships? What about after marriage relationships? What about, uh, so those are questions that I would start writing up here because then those are the things that I'm going to go and look for in Scripture. So for this, um, Terry said how to validate Scripture, how, how to validate the, the histor historicity of it or the, maybe the whole thing. What other questions would you ask? I've already answered kind of one of them in my prelogue, my pro preamble, prologue. Okay, who, put, who picked the books? That'd be good to know. Who picked the books?
Yeah, comparison. I'm just going to put comparison, but that's good. How, how does the Bible stand up to other uh, religious writings? Fulfilled prophecy. I'm going to just put fulfilled and future. What else? Uh, this is, well, I won't go there right now. Any others? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so organization. Right, okay. So, um, let's see, accuracy. Any other questions? We, so I would start thinking, where would we go to find the answers to these things? Okay, you can do some of them with history, and certainly I, I bring that in when I do teachings about where we get the scriptures from, but I want you to, I, I want you to know something. I, I want to say something to you and, and let you understand in, in this way when it deals with history. We almost would accept a flawed historian's record over the scripture, scriptural record, right? Uh, the, how many believe that um, Julius Caesar existed? Anybody? Y'all didn't raise your hands. Anybody believe in Julius Caesar? How do you know? <laughs> well, multiple historians. What about, for, okay, that's right, multiple historians. What about anything from his time? His face is on his coins, that's right. There is nothing, there is no book or treatise or anything else except the Bible that affirms, well, the Bible affirms Augustus Caesar. I was Julius Caesar. There's nothing written from Julius Caesar's days that the original is extant, that we still have the original. And in fact, there's only three scraps for his, uh, what was his book? Was it called Battles or Campaigns? What was it called? Caesar's book. Anyway, there's only three fragments, and they were copies much later. And so, but none of us have a problem with Julius Caesar. But you start talking about the fragmentary histo historical remnants of Scripture, and everybody's got a wait, but what if? You know, so you see what I mean? It's, it, it is probably the most prejudiced um, engagement against anything that's ever been written in history uh, because, and, and let me just ask you, this, is, this would be a question that would go here. Why is that? Why do people attack Scripture more than they attack the Koran, more than they attack any of these other things? Why? Yes, yes. Even before it's the truth. I believe it's the truth, but even before that, because it demands something of us, right? So if, if Jesus isn't Lord, we can do, talk, smoke, drink, chew, Whatever we want to do, because nobody, I mean, you know, if there is no Lord, we're wasting our time here tonight. There's nothing. But if there is a Lord, and he's the Lord of this book, then all of a sudden this book is over me. It, it impinges upon me. It tells me how to live. And so that's why. That's the, that's the real attack on Scripture. It's not because people don't like it. I mean, I guarantee you that if it didn't make truth claims like it does, they'd be studying it in every, every university in the world because of just the fascination of a historical book that goes back so far. But because it makes truth claims that, that, that weigh in on our lives, then it becomes attacked. Does that make sense? So that, those would be questions that I would have. So where would we go aside from history, let's, let's talk about the Bible. We want to know what the Bible says about the Bible. Uh, by the way, those are some questions that I would ask. I would ask, what does the Bible claim? Let me see if I got these. I think I do. Oh, here, here are some of my questions. Why is this an issue? Why, is, why, is the, why are these prompts an issue? It's because of the truth claims, right? It's because of that, this nature that it, if it's true, then as Desi said to Lucy, we got some explaining to do, right? I mean, if this is true, 
our lives are out of whack and our cultures are out of whack. So why is this an issue? I would ask, what does the Bible claim? What does the Bible say about itself? What, the, what does it, does it, do the writers of the Bible think that they're writing Scripture? Do they, do they, well, don't answer yet. I'm at, that's the next step. Y'all are getting way ahead of me. <laughs> the third question that I would ask is how did Jesus treat the Bible? What did, Jesus is the one we follow. What did he say about the Bible? What did, how did he interact with it? Did, and, and so we, that'd be something important to know. Four, do cultural changes affect it? All right, so it, it, obviously Jesus lived a long time ago. Does he still speak into today? Uh, Moses lived a long, long time ago. Does he still speak into today? So that's a question that we need to answer. Do cultural changes affect it? So um, I, I would also say, why don't people believe it? I've already answered that one for you. What's the most difficult? Oh, so here's one for you. What's the most difficult thing in the Bible to believe? Virgin birth. Okay, that's one. I would say that the resurrection is the most, I mean, because you can, there's always mystery when it comes to the virgin birth, right? So there's, there's mystery, and it is difficult to believe, but there's not, there, it's, it's, it's a teaching, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a witness, but it's not, it, 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 it's not really, it, it's just out there. It's not really provable, except what they said. But the resurrection was provable. There were eyewitnesses who saw Jesus die and who saw him alive after he died. And that's, to me, that's, so our whole, our whole belief system is based on the most difficult thing to believe in all of Scripture, the rest of it should be fairly easy, right? And, and we, we struggle with all the, all the nuanced stuff that's out there, and we're just like, oh, yeah, but he, he rose again. Well, I, yeah, I believe he rose again, but if you believe that, why don't you believe that he's going to come again riding a white horse? You know, I mean, if he can rise again from the dead, he can have a flying horse. I mean, that, you know, if the whole thing... The sun stood still when Joshua, when Joshua prayed and God stood, stood the sun still. We're like, that's impossible. God put the sun there when he spoke it. Well, I mean, you know, how is that impossible? So uh, one of the things that I want to do as we look at all this is we, me often, build our houses on assumed beliefs. That is stuff that I learned a long time ago and accepted and much of apologetics, much of teaching people is showing, is teaching them those basic things. If you believe that the universe just got hot one day and blew up and everything went into its place at exactly the right temperature, at exactly the right spacing, at exactly the right speed, at exactly the right time, if you believe that, you're not going to believe the Bible. Because by the end of it, there are so many things that that are built on the fact that God created by, to quote theologians, by special fiat, that is by the command of his voice, he created all that there is. If you start there, this is an easy book to understand and believe. If you don't believe that, then you're not going to, you're, you're going to have problems with all the rest of it. You, you, you know, and, and so that's really, that's why, that's why I find Genesis 1 to 11 to be such a foundation for all that we believe about the Bible. But anyway, that's not, we're not going to go that. So let's talk about the first one. What does the Bible claim about itself? Does anybody have a Bible verse that would speak to a claim? All right. Uh, let's, I, I heard two right there. So, um, Joshua, would you look up 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 16, and in your loudest fireman voice, read it to us, please, sir.
All right. Very good. Who? Uh, yeah, read 14 and 15. Because I. Yeah, you know, that's good. You're good. Yeah, very good. Thank you. So who is writing that? Paul. Who is he writing it to? Timothy. Who taught Timothy? Lois and Eunice. What did they teach him? Which scriptures? The Old Testament scriptures. The sacred writings, what it's called the sacred writings right there. And so that means, and, and notice that the sacred writings make one wise unto salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Old Testament leads to Jesus in that, in, in then for sure, if we handle it right now too. So I want you to see, what I, what I want you to see is that Paul says that those old scriptures those sacred writings, which he's talking about the law, the prophets, the writings of the Old Testament, that they are breathed out, for all Scripture is breathed out. Whoever asked about divinely inspired, ultimately that's the definition for divinely inspired. The Bible is inspired differently than Beethoven was, was inspired. And we, we use the word inspired. Oh, I saw the sun, sunset and it inspired me to sing this poem. <laughs> or whatever we do. Uh, that's not inspiration in the biblical term. Inspiration in the biblical term, what, what version did you read from? ESV. ESV. So the ESV actually translates that, um, that what we would, most of them say inspired, it says God breathed, which is exactly that word. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's the word God, theos, and, uh, and breathe. <sighs> so that's what, div that's what divine inspiration means. Paul said that all Scripture, everything that's Scripture, is breathed out by God. What does that mean? Okay, yeah, it means it's true. What's it mean first, before it means it's true? He spoke it. That's right. He spoke it. So that, that's, that's a first one. What's another Bible verse that speaks to the nature of Scripture? Anybody? Anybody? Somebody look up 1 Timothy 5.18. Miss Claudette, you're fast. I'll let you do that, and you can read it in your loudest hairdresser voice. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right. Does anybody know why we read that? Did y'all hear that? No. You didn't hear all of it? Uh, so for the Scripture says... Thou shalt not muzzle the ox, and the, wor and, and the worker is worthy of his hire. So the Scripture says two things, Paul says in writing that to 1 Timothy. Does anybody know why? Where is the first one from? The Old Testament. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Uh, don't muzzle, muzzle an ox while he threshes. But does anybody know where the second one is from? Who said it? Luke 10. It's from Luke 10. Jesus said it. Luke 10. I want you to recognize that Luke's gospel couldn't have been out more than 15 years, maybe even less than that. And Paul quotes from it and says, the scriptures say. And so that's, that is an affirmation that even then, even just in those short years after Jesus' resurrection, that, that uh, they are already acknowledging what's Scripture and what's not Scripture. That's good. John, that's good, man. I'm, I'm really impressed. Well, a little help from your friends is all right, man. I'm, I'm really impressed. That's good. Somebody have another one. Let's go to another one. What about 1 Peter 1? Somebody want to read that? Miss Vicki, can you do that for me? And your loudest lunch lady voice? 1 Peter 1, 22 to 25. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. Keep going. Keep reading. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so you see, he, that's another quote from the Old Testament that Peter brings out to talk about how the Word is what brings us new life. The Word is what does this. So th this is all writers of the New Testament here talking about the, the Bible. But he quotes this from the Old Testament, which was also talking about the Word of God. The Word of God endures forever. That's from Isaiah, and, and it, does, it, it does endure forever. 2 Peter 1, 16 to 21. I, I'm, you don't have to look all these up. We don't have time for all this. But let me just tell you what those say. Uh, in, in 2 Peter 1, he says that... Um, oh, rats. He says that... 2 Peter... I'm just going to have to look. My brain's working faster. All right, I'll look. Here we go. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so what Peter is doing is he's affirming through his relationship with Jesus all of the Old Testament prophecies that came before saying that men didn't write those things, but the Holy Spirit did. So those are searching the Scriptures. Let me show you some other stuff. You're going to have to listen fast because I've taken too much time. What is the Word of the Lord? In Psalm 33, 6, it says, By the Word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of His mouth all their host. Listen, if you don't believe that God is the Creator, you've got problems with the Bible already. I mean, you, you just can't. The, the two cannot be justified together. The words of Jeremiah, to whom the word of the Lord came in the day of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. This is the beginning of the book of Jeremiah, and he's saying that it came as the word of the Lord. God put words in men's mouths. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And so this is, that's, that's a picture of divine inspiration, God's words through Jeremiah. By the way, I do not believe that when I preach that God has put his word in my mouth the same way that he did Jeremiah. However, his word is in my mouth when I'm reading scripture aloud, right? So that's the difference. God did something in those prophets in the Old Testament differently than he does through me typically. I have never uh, to my knowledge, I've never been a prophet. I've just, not in that way, I've been a prophet in the way that I says, thus saith the Lord, this is God's word. Everybody good? All right. God spoke to them in visions and appearances. He said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. He's talking about the prophetic office there in Numbers chapter 12. Genesis 18, now the Lord appeared to him, that's Abraham, by the oaks of Mamre, which, which while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. Genesis chapter 18, the Lord showed up at Abraham's doorstep and talked to him. And, the, and so we're talking about, we're not just, often we say, well, Jesus is the divine word. And when we say that, we're true, but we lose track of what it really means. And then when we say, this is the word of God. It's true, but we lose track of what it means. I would prefer, and, and this is just the way I think about it, these are the words of God. It is the word of God, but these are the words of God. That's how important this is. And so um, we have, we, we saw, let's see what else. God commands them to write. Here, here Peter, your question about how do we, how can we trust these guys? Um, which is still a question, our trust should be more in God to preserve his word, that God preserves his word. But 
everybody else, I mean, it wasn't like they lived in a vacuum. Most of these prophets lived right around each other. They, they prophesied in the same eras. They're clumped in together. And so they knew what each other was saying, just like the apostles knew what each other was saying. And so the Lord said to Moses, write then this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua. Well, I want you to see the chain of custody. Moses writes it. He recites it to Joshua. Moses dies 40 years later. And Joshua, God says, don't turn right or left from my word. What word? The word that Moses wrote. How, and so it's not like the, the Jewish people or the Israelites were wandering around in the wilderness and then went and moved into Canaan land and then like 2,000 years later said, oh, look at this scroll. They had it from the time Moses wrote it, right? I mean, there's never a time that they lost it. It's there. For all of those years, they had it. It's why in Deuteronomy 6, he says, teach it to your kids when they stand up and lie down. When they, I mean, they knew it. They knew it. I mean, it just came out. Came out. Any of you have ever been amazed at either, a, 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 well, I'll just say a foreign restaurant, whether it's a, a Hispanic restaurant or a Chinese restaurant or wherever you go, and the, the waitress will come up and won't write anything down and your order will be exactly right? I mean, it happens all the time, all the time, no matter how big your party is. Uh, sometimes, if they're not as good as the other ones, they'll repeat it back to you just to make sure. Some of them know it so well, they're just like, okay, I'll be back. <laughs> and they come back with exactly what you ordered. The reason why is because there are people who learn by hearing and recitation. We've stopped doing that in our culture, and so we can't imagine uh, 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 the way that the Bible can be taken from place to place. They memorized whole books of it. I mean, they, they just, and they, and they recited it. They knew it. They, they knew what was coming. And, and so um, I, I just say all that to say that, that Moses wrote it down and it stayed with him. And then to Jeremiah, he says, take a scroll and write on it all the words which I have spoken to you concerning Israel. Do you know what that's called? The book of Jeremiah. <laughs> that's what we have. He wrote it because God told him to write it. So there are lots of other things that I could say. Um, commandments and statutes and precepts because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge my commandments my statutes and my laws the laws didn't just come about when Moses took them at Sinai uh, it was I mean Abraham knew them and followed them according to what the Lord said um, writing it down we just read that reading it publicly until I come give attention to the public reading of scripture that's in first Timothy this has been practiced with people who are following the one true God for all time. Do you know what kings were supposed to do when they became king of Israel or Judah? They were supposed to write their own copy. That's, how, that's what we're talking about. That's what you and I go to Walmart and buy. That's how important this book is. So if everything I said is true, well, meditate upon it. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. We should obey it. It shall be with the king, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord as God by carefully observing all the words of the law and these statutes, Deuteronomy 17, 19. This is, this is the practice of, of God followers God worshipers, Yahweh followers in the Old Testament, Christ followers in the New Testament. This has been our practice. It's our heritage. This book is not some foreign book that fell out of the sky in 1943, right? I mean, they, they, they've had it for years. By the way, this book was compiled together before, before 312 and the Council of whatever, Constantinople, I guess, Nicaea. Yeah, it, it did it before that. It was done before that. It happened, yeah, Constantinople wasn't even a place then. I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so way back then, they just came and codified it. They, they said, this is what we're going to do. But the practice of these books had been in existence for the early church. That's how they kept them. The early church. Now, they may not have had every copy of everything, but they together, the, those early churches that were scattered around, they had copies of all of this. And it was all together, and it, they were using it regularly. In fact, Peter says, that was the chapter 3 of 2 Peter, 2 Peter 3, he says, even pay attention to Paul, even though he's difficult to understand. 
right? He even recognized that Paul was writing Scripture. They knew it even then. They understood what was coming out. So what are the implications for us? What does this mean about this uh, everything? What does it mean about everything? It means this. God exists and he speaks and has spoken, right? All of this is true. We've been taught not to use circular logic when defending something. If I've been told once, I've been told a hundred times by teachers all spanning the globe that you can't define something, a word with that word, right? Y'all been told that? You can't define a word with that word? And so we take it to Scripture and say, well, we can't let the Bible, uh, that the Bible um, describe all this. Well, who else is going to describe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, right? I mean, who else is going to say that? Who else was there in the beginning? In fact, that was God's charge to Job. Were you there? Were you there? And so, if God exists and he created everything that we have, then he is greater than we are, but we have attributes like speaking and writing. This is not too big for God. If God didn't exist, we have a greater problem. If God doesn't exist, we got a lot of explaining to do. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that has no, has no sense. It becomes nonsensical. And, and it, even there's no such thing as ethics. Or if there's not a God, if there's not a, a transcendental being, we've, got, we've just got lies is all we have. And so God exists, speaks, and has spoken. The Bible attests to that. You can see it out in the world. Men wrote his words at his command. God told them to write, they wrote. God told Moses to write, he wrote and recited, and it was passed down. Men wrote his words at his command. The Bible claims to be that word, right? So we have God, we have him speaking, we have him speaking and telling people to write it down, and we have this this copy of of words saying that it is that word that tome of of writing down what God said to to read or to write. And so if the Bible is God's word, then it carries his authority, right? And so what what this means to us, we talked about divine inspiration. Men wrote his words down at his command. Now, when we talk about it, it, it doesn't always mean that God spoke out loud to them. I believe in the New Testament, God spoke through their personalities and they wrote, but I still believe he safeguarded all of that stuff. But in the, in the Old Testament, it's clear God told him, hey, write this stuff down, and they wrote it down. You know, like, um, I don't know, take a memo, you know? And so they took a memo. That's, that's what God was doing to them. And if that's God's word... Then, then, and because God is true, he claims to be true, he is the source of all truth, then what we have is his words that stand as his authority over all of us. There's no, there's no quibbling. What we want to do is we want to say, well, we believe God, but we believe that he couldn't take care of his word all the way down the line. Right? I mean, because we say, well, there's... There's these nuances. What, you know, does James really belong in here? Does James really belong in here? Well, we need to get rid of that. Or, or half, you know, there's, there's this, this seminar called the Jesus Seminar who existed in the 20th century, and it was a bunch of men who decided that most of the Gospels were made up, weren't true. And they, they even color-coded the, the words, and they said, well, this, this looks like a word that Jesus would say, but this word over here, Jesus wouldn't say that. Well, how do they know? Right? You can't do that. But that presupposition, so, so there is either a God who reveals, and if he reveals, he reveals truth, and if he reveals truth, he revealed it in this word, or man is smarter to God than God, which means there is no God. That's, the, that's really the conundrum that we're in. There's a lot of people who make a lot of hay and a lot of money going around attacking God's word, but they're doing it based on fallacy that just isn't, this isn't true. They're trying to build difficult things. I don't have time to do all that. But anyway, so if the Bible is God's word, it carries his authority. 
that is the question that is the question of how to defend the Bible's authority. The, the Bible is God's word. It either is or it isn't. Now, you are not. I'm, I'm going to speak directly to the person who asked this because I know I, I've had this conversation before, but it's easier for me to do this in dialogue. So, Miss Claudette, I want you to know that, uh, by the way, she, she's, she believes the Bible is authoritative. She just wants to know how to explain it and really how to defend it and it's transmission to other people who aren't believing. I will tell you this, that you can't believe God's word without believing in God. One leads to the other. And, in, and I believe, based on the first Peter that, we re, that Vicky read to us, I believe that the reading of God's word aloud does things in people's hearts that you and I arguing about it can't do. Right? I, I, think it, I, I think that the Holy Spirit takes it and does something. And so, but I don't think there's anything that we can say. I don't think there's anything we can say to convince somebody about God's word. Because what it means is they have to change their life. If this is true, God commands our life. Right? And so that means that I can't go and do what I want to do. I can't think what I want to do. I can't watch what I want to do. I can't be with who I want to be all the time. I have to do, I have to obey. Because that's the only choice with God's authority speaking to us. And so most people aren't objecting to God's word because of its transmission or because we don't have enough copies of it or because they're rejecting it because they don't want to obey it. If this is true, like I said, we've got some explaining to do. We, we, our lives have to be conformed to, to him. So if the Bible is God's word, it carries his authority. The last thing I want to say is the best translations, because this is God's word, the best translations reveal God's word to us, right? They don't obscure it. Now, there are several approaches to the way that people do Bible translations in the English. One is called formal equivalency. Equivalency just means equal to. Formal means um, a formal approach. In this case, means word for word. When I ask when I asked Joshua about what version he was reading from, he said the English Standard Version, and the reason why is because it actually translated without glossing over that word theopneustos, which is God breathed. And so it said God breathed. Mine says inspired, which is a little bit of a gloss. They've taken that, that word that is so vivid in Greek, and they've glossed it to make it a word that we use called inspired. But when he reads that, that does not obscure it at all. It's, it's crystal clear. So there are other translations uh, that use a different approach. So the ones that use that approach would be the King James, um, the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, the New King James, um, the, the uh, Christian Standard Bible, CSB. Those are the ones that are formally equivalent, word for word. Every word that's in the original manuscripts, they try to, they deal with. And every word that's not that they supply, they put in, in uh, italics. So when you're reading a, your Bible and you see an italicized word, they've supplied it. They, they've added it because it wasn't in the original just for ease of reading. There are other Bible translations that use what's called dynamic equivalence. It's not formal. It's not word for word. It's really thought for thought. They try to take the essence of whatever was written in the Greek and Hebrew, and they try to make it easy for us to understand. My problem with that, I, I, don't, I don't knock it, but my problem with it is that there's another human in between me and God's Word now. They've taken it, and they've, they've tried to make it where I can understand it. And so those are, those are ones like the New, New International Version, uh, the NIV, the, uh, help me out, the NRSV, the New, uh, the new Living uh, is like that. They're really easy. I love the New Living to read out loud, but it does obscure, and you're at the, you're at the mercy of the editor to, to, to do it right. Uh, so there's an extra step in there. I want the translation, first of all, I, when somebody comes up to me, if Peter, if Peter came up to me, he's never done this, but if Peter came up to me and said, hey, Jim, uh, what Bible translation should I read? And I, I would say to him, usually, should, what do you think about the King James, he might ask. And I'd say, well, I'd much rather you read the NIV than not read the King James, 
right? So if, if the King James Version is an obstacle to you because, it's, because of its antiquated speech and it's difficult for you to understand, don't, don't worry about it. Get one that you can read and will read. I'd rather you read that. I'd rather you read one with dynamic equivalence than not read God's Word at all. However, I believe that um, those that are more formal, that's why I preach from the New American Standard or the ESV. It's why I, I preach from that because I want to deal with the words I want to know what God said, not what somebody else thinks about what God said. It's why I would recommend that if you do devotions in the morning, it's great to have your devotional book. Those are really good, but I want you to read the Bible too. Read the Bible. The Bible is the, the Word of God. It makes one wise unto salvation. It's the, it's the strength of God's Word. So the best translations, I believe, are those that are formally equivalent. However, I want you to read one that you can read with understanding so I'm okay with the NIV, New Living Translation. I just don't preach from them because there's some things that they do that I'm not really, uh, I'm not really happy with uh, in my own life. Yes, sir. Uh, didn't you say in chapter 4 a couple of weeks ago that like the New King James maybe teaches some technological things that might not be true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, that, I think that the King James and the New King James, New King James mainly because, of its, because it's still a little bit modernized, but I believe they're the easiest to, for, at least for me, they're the easiest to memorize because they, they sound like Bible, right? They sound like it. And so I can, I can hear it. It, it. The New American Standard, which I love, is very, very difficult for me to, to memorize because it sounds like normal talk. And so it's hard for me. That's why when I'm, when I'm quoting scripture on Sunday mornings or I'm, and sometimes I get all discombobulated, it's because I've got, I've got two versions really in my head going after each other trying to bring it out and I just get I, I get sidetracked sometimes doing that but so yeah I think New King James is, is a lot easier to memorize than New American Standard for sure English Standard is probably the, the happy medium between easy to read and still sounds like the Bible when you read it um, New American Standard New American Standard sounds like the Bible but it's just really flat, if you will. It's not poetic. It's just flat. And because it's, it's word for word, exactly like, exactly that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's word for word. All right. So three questions again, how to defend the Bible's authority. I defend it, not trying to explain all the transmission stuff, how we got it, how many manuscripts there are, all that stuff. I explain it because it's God's word. He safeguards it. And it's, it's authority is because it's his word. You know, why should I listen to you, mom? And she says, well, my, my wife said, because <laughs> I'm going to beat you now and your dad's going to beat you when he gets here. But, but some moms, why? Because, because, you know, dad said, dad said. So the very first sin on, of humankind did God really say, thou shalt not eat of the tree in the middle of the garden? So God's word is matter. So that's his, his authority. Number two, define divinely inspired. It's God breathed. God breathed the very words. Uh, the, the practical implications for scripture, I believe every word in scripture uh, in the original documents, in the, obviously printers can go bad. There was one Bible, uh, King James iteration of Bibles hundreds of years ago that said, thou shalt murder. <laughs> they just left out the not and thou shalt not murder. It says thou shalt murder. Obviously that's not God's word, right? So it's not that a printer can't make a mistake in scripture. What we're saying is that the original manuscripts were absolutely flawless because they were God's word. That's what we mean. And so divine, divinely inspired, every word that's here meant to be here. Every word that's not here is not meant to be here. And then Bible translations to be avoided, those that are very sloppy with handling of God's word. That's probably the way I would say it. Those that, that change the meanings of what God's word says. So any questions? I know that's, is this cool? Is this a good, uh, I want, what I want you to do, they're not going to all be like this. This is foundational. Everything else, we're just going gonna, gonna to presume that God's Word is God's Word from here on out. And we're going to go back to it. But we're going to use this format, the prompts that you gave me, how to question those prompts to come up with the right answers. Then where do we go in Scripture to find those things? And how do we look through those things? By the way, if you're going to use God's Word to build your life on, you need to know God's Word. 
You need to read it. It needs to be a part of your life. You can't just take out your one little slip of daily bread out of the loaf on, in the morning and read it and think you know God's Word. You, you need to know God's Word, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. It all adds up to knowing Christ, to knowing Christ. 